The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. In each episode of The Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that could happen in different areas of the world. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. We'll explore scenarios from a worldwide financial collapse to a coordinated terrorist attack to a global climate catastrophe and everything in between. The Survivalist Podcast is brought to you by Survival Cash, Ford Survival Supply, and TheBugOutRace.com. Please visit our website, TheSurvivalistPodcast.com, for more information or to give us feedback. And now, The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. Today, we're going to talk about earthquakes. Specifically, we're going to investigate whether the scenario from the movie San Andreas, which featured one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded that destroyed much of California, is real. How real it is. And then we're going to look at how you can prepare yourself in the event of a catastrophic earthquake in your area. So obviously that movie takes some artistic license. You know, I've done some research uh, just preparing for this podcast, and it seems like most geologists say that a lot of the stuff that happens in that movie is not really real or is exaggerated for effect. However, there's another scenario uh, that a lot of geologists think is, is very real and very imminent. There's another fault that's called the Cascadia Subduction Zone Fault that runs uh, basically a little, mostly out to sea, but also on some parts on land, that runs from uh, Vancouver down to Northern California and um, has the potential... Uh, to give us the most devastating earthquake uh, that America's ever had. Yep, and that's what what I read. It pretty much said, what, everyone west of I-5 in that area is going to be toast. (laughs) It's a a very terrifying scenario and very real. Apparently, so there's a giant tectonic plate uh, that's called the uh, North America plate that we all sit on. And mm-hmm. then there's another one that's just out to sea, which is called the uh, well, Juan de Fuca. Juan de Fuca plate, right? And apparently yep. the Juan de Fuca plate is sliding under the North American plate or subducting under that plate. Right. And it does it about 20 milliliter, millimeters a year. But Yeah, and like the analogy you said is like you put, you put your middle fingers together from your right and left hand, and your right hand's North America. Your left hand is the Juan de Fuca plate. Uh, essentially, you know, under the Pacific Ocean, and you just run your middle finger from your right hand up your left hand. And rather than it running up your finger, it's you turn your knuckles up. So all that that land mass is just it's just building up and building up and building up and building up. It's overdue. It's not a matter of, you know, we say this all the time. It's not a matter of if it's a matter of when this is going to something big is going to happen. That's exactly right. So on average, over the last 10,000 years, this particular type of oh, earthquake... Matt, on one note, I want to preface this. The last time we talked about active shooter, uh, we had San Bernardino happen a week later. So we might be a little... We might have ESPN on our podcast. Just just saying. ESP. ESP. ESP between <laughs> Not Matt, ESPN. Between, between Gold and Pooh Holly, we are predicting shit on the Survivalist podcast. You know what? That's true, Mark. I mean, it's uh, it's true. And uh, here's what we know. Over the last 10,000 years, this particular earthquake along the Cascadia fault line has happened about every 250 years or so. Um, and they have documented evidence out of, out of Japan, actually, and out of the rocks in California that the last time it happened was in 1700. So uh, it was due in 1950, so right now it's 65 years overdue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is a really it is something to be aware of. Um, now I think what we're going to do is we're going to have our friend Scott join us, and Scott's a really interesting guy. We'll 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 uh, let's have Peter, the producer, reach out and get him. And while he's doing that, I'll, uh, Mark and I will tell you about who Scott is. He's part of uh, Forge Survival Supply and Survival Cash as well. At least he's an advisor for that, right? Yeah, he's an advisor, and he's also a contributing author to the Survival Cash team. So he was a Navy SEAL, is that right? He was not only a Navy SEAL, but he was also a Marine. He was a recon Marine. Then he uh, he got out of the Marine Corps, went to college, and then he decided to go – he decided to get back in the military. And he – not only did he go back in the military, he did – he stayed kind of greenside, so, you know, Navy Marine Corps. But then he went to BUDS, so he went to SEAL school where he spent seven years 
uh, as a team leader, and he went to Iraq as a Navy SEAL. He served not only from the military, but he still wanted to continue to serve his country. He's now, he did some personal security detection details, so government contracting work, executive protection. Uh, he's also an EMT. So he brings a lot of experience. So he's been all over the world getting dirty, doing things, saving lives, protecting people. He's also a survivalist just like us. And now he's got the experience of working in law enforcement, and I think he works hand-in-hand with FEMA, which he'll be able to discuss in greater detail. I don't want to steal his thunder. So pretty much Scott's a badass. Okay, so we're getting Scott. Hello, Scott. Uh, We just set you up with uh, quite quite an introduction. Tell us a little bit about your time in emergency management preparedness. You know, the... um the Office of Emergency Services is, is a pretty big group of folks, and my focus was mostly dealing with counterterrorism type type of stuff and how to harden facilities. Uh, but I did touch a little bit on the earthquake stuff. That's a big deal here, especially in Northern California. You can't really get away from it. Um, so there's mm-hmm. definitely a lot of a lot of talk about that um, and a lot of planning that that went into how we deal with it and some of the past uh, experiences that we've had. Over here on this side of the country, um, you know, some lessons learned with that as well. Yeah, and Scott, just for uh, for our listeners, I mentioned you were a recon marine, you were a SEAL, you did some PSD work. Um, without divulging too much info, what you're doing now in, in California, um, we yeah. know you're a smart guy. It'll just it'll just help for the listeners. Oh, right on, no problem. Yeah, I do. I work in public safety now. I, I don't uh, currently work under the uh, Office of Emergency Services anymore. Mm-hmm. I did that for a little bit as a contractor, so now I, I'm working in public safety, specifically in law enforcement, and um, and I deal uh, a lot with uh, kind of larger larger venue type of events and and whatnot. Gotcha. In the past hundred years, earthquakes are some of the deadliest events ever to strike on Earth. If you look at the 1976 Tangshan earthquake in China. They think about 450,000 people died in that quake. And then more recently, there was the quake in Haiti where 160,000 people died. Um, I think that most people think, well, you know, those were sort of less developed places than America. And so the casualties wouldn't be as high in America. But I, I've read a few things to suggest that that could be otherwise. What do you think about that, Scott? I think current building codes that, that they've implemented since the, the last earthquake – Will obviously help with some of the lower magnitude ones, but at a certain point, uh, things are just going to fall down, and there's there's only so much you can do to to brace those when when the earth starts starts uh, trembling pretty hard. Uh, you know, ultimately, uh, I don't think there's there's a whole lot you can you can do to stop that, uh, especially some of the, the higher buildings and whatnot. You know, we haven't seen an earthquake on the scale that that hit Japan over here. You know, we've been we've been fortunate lately. I think ultimately, you know, there there are a lot of old buildings. There's a lot of infrastructure when you have the earth shifting with all the pipes under under the ground, the electrical wires, everything that we have. Um, there's just there's really no force in the universe that's going to be able to hold that stuff together. Right. Yeah. And, that and like the article said. Uh, just because codes were instituted, all those, all that, those buildings and infrastructure that was there, those buildings are still there. So they're going to be the first ones to go down. And uh, Matt, I'm sure you're going to say that you know glass is going to shatter immediately. We're going to lose electricity probably within 15 minutes or sooner. Sorry, Matt, I'm probably still in some. No, thunder. that's. What, I was just going to say that the 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 Japanese earthquake was a 9.0 magnitude, and the uh, the earthquake that some people especially this article from the new yorker are predicting that could happen in the pacific northwest they're saying a 9.6 magnitude earthquake could be possible yeah so that that would be that would be absolutely insane to uh you know even and, and you know i mentioned the building codes and whatnot but you know even recently in in san francisco they they redid a portion of the bridge and obviously with the standards that today's standards and and whatnot um uh, they're still having nothing fall apart with nothing happening. So, uh, you, you know, uh, a lot of times the, uh, you know, 
pointing to new building standards and codes and all that stuff, it's, it's more, I think, to make people feel better. Uh, but I think when the rubber meets the road and, and we have a big one, it's going to be a real eye-opening uh, experience for a lot of people. So, okay, yeah. So then Mark was describing, uh, so if this earthquake that, that people are saying is overdue, we're, we're just going to get into some of the descriptions of what it would feel like to experience it. Well, first and foremost, there's no early warning system here. We don't have that, especially in the Pacific North, Northwest like Japan does. The only thing that people up there are going to experience, they're going to experience a jolt and the initial waves are only going to be heard by dogs. Um, so there's going to be no early warning. Once the quake starts, the electrical grid is going to immediately fail. Uh, hospitals, nuclear power plants, things are going to, they're going to lose power immediately. Houses not bolted down to their foundations are going to slide off. They're going to slide off the foundation and collapse. Glass is going to shatter like we already mentioned. Landslides. Think about what Seattle is built on. There's a lot of people that are – there. it's essentially – it's right next to the Puget Sound and I don't want to say it's built on a swamp. But you're going to have liquid – liquid – liquid – liquid – liquefaction. Liquefaction. Liquef, liquefaction of the ground that a lot of uh, downtown Seattle is built on. That stuff's going to sink into the earth. The tsunami could occur – in as little as 15 minutes after the quake starts. So think about how many people could actually get out of the area in 15 minutes. If you know a tsunami's coming, you run. And you run, you don't look back, you don't look for a flashlight, you don't you save, you save your freaking ass and you get out of there if you can. If you can outrun a tsunami, which is, you know, we both we all know that's probably not too probable. Uh, roads will be impassable. It specifically talks about the coastal towns in Oregon. Scott, I don't know, I don't know if you've spent time up there, but I actually used to live in Oregon, and I'd, I've pretty much driven the entire Oregonian coast. Some of the, the local municipalities think that school children and the, the inhabitants of these small coastal towns are simply going to be able to drive away. Well, the experts say there's not going to be road that's passable for them to get away to higher ground. Right. So that's, that's the initial – the quake starts and – probably like the first 15 to 30 minutes and then you know they have these uh different uh different response groups uh you know search and rescue type of uh you know disaster response uh cells and you know i've been out of the business a little bit with that so i, I can't remember the, the exact uh words they use me able to come to me but uh um you know typically those are assigned in by regions and um and you know for those for those poor unfortunate folks who are trapped under rubble or trapped in their homes or trapped in office buildings or, you know, have a, uh, you know, some type of road structure collapse on a car. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be, there's going to be a significant amount of time before the assets can be put in place to, to help people out. Um, you know, most of the first responders in the area will, will do what they can, uh, obviously to help out, but at the same time, they're, they're victims as well. So, and they've got their families and, you know, they're trying to, they're going to be trying to do all they can, but uh, Scott, a lot of the equipment that, and uh, with that, can I ask you real that? quick? I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we've talked about this before in, in previous episodes. And of course we're talking about it now. We're probably, I'm sure we're going to talk about it again in future episodes from okay. working with law enforcement. What briefs are given? Um, have you guys talked to this? Have you trained to it from a, Okay, do my duty first, then check on my family or my family man first, or am I doing a little bit of both? Am I trying to reach them, trying to get to my post? Uh, can you talk to that a little bit? Right, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, a lot of that is going to, a, a lot of the exact details of that is probably going to vary from department to department and agency to agency. However, you know, the, the big things are, um, you know, if you're, if you're on duty, you're on duty. Um, mm -hmm. If you have some type of extenuating circumstance, you know, obviously that, that stuff is all taken into account. But if you're on duty, you know, you're, you're trying to secure, um, you know, the population where you're at and, and fulfill your, your duty and, and taskings from, from higher level. Um, once that area becomes a disaster area, a declared disaster area, um, some of the chain of command is going to change too, because the state and federal is going to move in and take over, and they've got their own assets in place, and they, they're going to, you know, they're going to try to relieve the uh, the local folks as quickly as possible, so that they can also take care of, you know, their their victims as well as everyone else, and take care of their families. Um, 
you know, for, for some of the folks who travel out of the area and, and don't necessarily work in the cities or counties, um, that they, they don't live and work in the same County. Um, you know, if there's something like the, the roads are shut down, they can't make it down to assist, uh, you know, our, our kind of standing, uh, our, our standing orders are to report to the local closest, um, you know, agency and assist those guys. So, Mark, let's say that you feel this jolt, right? This is kind of what we're saying. You'll feel an initial jolt, and then maybe your dog starts barking, going crazy, and you start hearing all the dogs barking. And then what if you figure it out? You know, you have about 90 seconds before uh, the ground's going to start uh, really going crazy. What, what can you do at that moment? To survive an earthquake like we've probably all seen and heard, you want to get under something stable, like a strong, strong um, a desk. Not a not a paperweight foldable table, but something strong that you can get under to to protect your head from falling debris. Um, if you're outside, probably get away from anything that can fall on you: telephone poles, trees, etc. You want to protect your your head. You you want to get under some form of cover and some form of strong cover that's not going to collapse if something falls on it. If you're going to try to evacuate a building, you don't want to use the elevator because you don't want to get stuck in an elevator. So you want to try to, you know, get out through a staircase. But I think then it's a it's a risk versus gain where, okay, if I'm on the 30th floor, how long would it take me to get out of there to pretend? And if I'm in a stairwell, what about getting stuck in there? Maybe it's trying. It, maybe it's just best to stay in place and get under something to where you're not going to nothing's going to fall on you. Right. And then um, if I'm close to the water. I mean, I lived in Hawaii too, and we would have tsunami drills every month. We'd, the tsunami sirens would go off. And like I said, they don't have an early warning system in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure in the coastal towns if they or not if they do have sirens, but I would think about getting my ass to the high ground as fast as possible. And, um, and of course, you know, if, for me, is, is my daughter with me? Where is she? I would try to, I'd want to try to get to her or warn her about what was potentially coming, you know, if she were in school or if it was the summer and she was working and what have you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, uh, you know, on that note, even if it didn't fall down during the initial earthquake, um, right. going back inside a building afterwards, uh, even aftershocks or just the whole thing's destabilized, you just never know when that thing could come down. So, um, yeah, definitely stay, stay outside. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good good point, Scott. Now, for, uh, also from Catherine Schultz, who wrote this article in The New Yorker, apparently after she wrote it in uh, June of 2015, so many people were freaked out that she felt compelled to write a follow-up um, with sort of a little bit of helpful advice about what you can do. So one thing she said is if you own a home anywhere west of the Cascade Mountains, pretty much anywhere from Vancouver, that is, all the way down to uh, Sacramento, California, uh, there's some things you have to do. So, how many people are is that are we talking about there? Is it? It's a tremendous amount of people, right? Yeah, you know, just down here in you know the uh, San Francisco area, we're just in the city itself. We're between eight hundred nine hundred thousand people, and uh, you know, Sacramento isn't isn't quite as large, but um, they're coming in at around five hundred thousand people. If your home is on its foundation, is not bolted to the foundation that when this happens, if you live in that zone, your home could slide right off the foundation and crumble and collapse, right? And so no matter if you're under a table or whatever, a desk, you're going to, you're going to probably die if that happens. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, once again, when it's, when it's happening, it, everything's going to be, uh, falling apart so fast. Uh, you don't have a whole lot of options to kind of hope for, uh, Hope for the best and get out under whatever you can as quickly as possible. Or if you can actually get out of the building, that's a that's a good thing. It, you know, houses can slide and not totally collapse, uh, but uh, there's definitely that risk. Uh, another thing she talks about is uh, strapping down your water heater. I mean, apparently your water heater is like having a uh, a bomb in your basement, <laughs> and uh, right. it's a mm-hmm. big, heavy object. It's got an open flame with a gas line. So it could, uh, you know, I guess in earthquakes, a lot of times they they uh, fall over, smash the line, start a fire. Sometimes they start a fire and a flood at the same time. Last, yeah. uh, another thing she talks about is redecorate your home with an eye to gravity. So uh, don't put, you know, a giant heavy picture or mirror above your bed where um, if, right. if there's an earthquake, it could fall and just behead you, right? 
Um, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, you mean the mirrors above my bed aren't going to be – they're not going to fly? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that, that mirrored room that I have, uh, uh, that red room, what? Uh, and then there's two things that um, I want to talk about that you guys are experts in. One is make a plan with your family and the second is get to know your neighbors. And I think both of these are real – are tenets of uh, preparedness and survivalism, right? Can you, can you talk a bit about those? Like we've talked about this in uh, – in other episodes is you, you have a plan, right? So if, if dad's not home, where are we going to meet? Where are we going to go to? If something like if the house starts shaking, Hey, we're going to, you're going to have a plan. We're going to meet at the middle of the street on the cul-de-sac. Uh, we're going to get there as fast as possible. And if someone's not home, we're going to, we're going to get out of the area where we currently are to get safe. And then we're going to establish communication and, and then, a link up plan of where we're going to go to. Yeah. So neighbors are amazing, uh, resources for, for everyone. You know, most people, unless you're living way out in the sticks, you, you've got neighbors They're <clears throat> They're the people who are going to let you know if, if someone suspicious has been hanging around, they're the folks who are going to let you know if water's leaking out of your yard onto the street and, uh, save you from that. And along that lines, you get, you get to know them. If something happens, like an earthquake, houses are collapsing, uh, just anything, they're going to come over and they're going to they're going to check on you, make sure everything is okay. If you're stuck under something, you know they'll be able to either help you or get the word out. And likewise, you're doing that for your neighbors. So getting to know your neighbors and um, kind of raising that kind of concern level uh, across the board and having those good relationships is going to really help. Uh, you know, when you need friends. In a disaster, for example, um, that stuff is really going to pay out huge dividends. If you're living in a neighborhood where everyone's just kind of hunkered in their house all the time and never, you know, waving at each other when they come home or saying hi or at least, you know, checking in every now and then, um, it's it's probably going to be a lot different type of situation where everybody's just kind of looking out for the themselves and, and uh, you know, they don't have a whole lot of emotional investment in, in the folks living around them. Yeah, I remember, Mark, when we were making the TV show that there was that uh, family that had moved way out in California, uh, in Colorado, right? They lived uh, – yep. and they didn't even want to know their neighbors because they were so certain that, you know, the shit was going to hit the fan uh, and they felt they were self-sustaining. But we proved to them that they that they couldn't be, right? Right, and especially where they were, they were in a big open plain, Scott, right in uh, Colorado Springs. So – not only could, could they be seen for miles, it would be – you can't – I mean we know this military. You can't defend everywhere and so we're like right. – and with with two adults and four girls, what? One was a teenager and the rest were under six years old. It's not like he had a fire yeah. team to help uh, you know, with, an AK, with, a, with a gun in their hand. So we're like, man, you really – you should solicit the people to your left and right to help you in case anything bad were to happen and uh, – we attacked them, like Matt said, and um, you, can't, you defend everywhere, you defend nowhere. And so they, they felt right. That, yeah. Yeah. And, and it showed the power of neighbors in a way because, you know, if they would have had some like-minded people living near them, they could have, uh, they could have probably been a bit more secure. But mm-hmm. so let's talk about what I consider the, the scariest possible scenario of this mega quake, which is if you live in what's called the tsunami – inundation zone so the tsunami inundation zone is coastal towns basically like towns that are you know cute very nice beautiful beach towns right on the water that are very desirable to live in uh those uh are probably the most dangerous places to live that if you're in the inundation zone the tsunami will come like mark said about 10 to 20 minutes after the uh, you feel that quaking and shaking. And it will look like the whole ocean is elevated, overtaking the land. It'll move at about 13 miles an hour, apparently, which is, apparently if it's 6.7 miles an hour, pretty much no grown man can, can stand up in it. They'll be knocked over. Uh, so if, this is double that. So it's going to knock over everyone. And um, it's not just water either. It picks up all this stuff once it reaches shore. So in this size of an earthquake, it would be about five stories tall. And it's going to have, you know, water, pickup trucks, door frames, cinder blocks, utility poles, fishing boats, all that stuff. Uh, and that's going to be coming right at you. So what, And Matt, yeah. it's going to be 700 freaking miles long, possibly 700 miles long of water. 
Right. So let's say that you're in this, you're in a town like Seaside, Oregon. You, you feel that quake. What What do you do, Mark uh, or Scott? What do you do right right away after the quaking and shaking stops? Getting out of the area if you're in a, a coastal area as quick as possible is probably the best course of action. In, in theory, um, in reality, if everyone has the same idea that you have and you've got limited routes in and out, um, it's it's you know you may you may run into some problems there. Yeah. So you're uh, saying the roads are going to be impassable. Either they broke in half from the quake or they're just totally jammed and clogged from other people, right? Right. So, I mean, high ground, if you if there's some high ground around there, um, I mean, there's there's not a, you know, not a whole lot. <laughs> you don't have a whole lot of options. Um, you know, it's, it's just a pretty bad worst case scenario all the way around. Um, you know, high ground and, and get out of the area is really the the two things if you have a happen to have a hot air balloon in your backyard then probably hop in that and (laughs) and, uh head straight up well that's i think matt they said that uh the the highest ground around seaside is like 45 feet tall right 45 to 50 feet above uh mean sea level so you don't have you got to go and you got to go far and you have to go far fast right to get to get either high or well, you're in Oregon, so you could probably get high easily. But you to get to high ground, okay. you have to uh, get out of there quickly, and you're going to have to go for miles to get to get to some elevation to to get above the water. So it's almost like if you were really uh, a survivalist, uh, you know, like we talked about uh, Joel, who is one of the co-founders of Forge Survival Supply with you guys, and Joel, you know, actually moved out of Washington, D.C. into the yep. mountains in Colorado. You know, he, he put his money where his mouth is. He's a survivalist, so he changed his whole lifestyle in order to live that life. It's almost like if you're a survivalist and you think this type of a mega quake could come, you, you don't live in that town, right? Well, you don't live there, or I've said this all my life. I don't want to live in a floodplain as much as I want to, like, Scott, I'm in central Texas, so I yes, I love the water. I would like to live right next to some of the rivers where everybody comes in the summer to float the river and drink beer and have fun, but I don't want to live in a floodplain. I also don't want to live yeah. in Tornado Alley. Uh, I don't want to live in the likelihood of a natural disaster occurring. I kind of really don't want to live there. Just And like yeah. Matt, with that survival mindset, I mean – we all have friends. I mean, some of my best friends are still active duty in the Marine Corps, and they live right on the Pacific Ocean. Yes, I was stationed in Hawaii. Fortunately, there was high ground around for a tsunami, but you know, wrong place, wrong time. And if you choose to live there, um, like the floods we had in South Texas this year, you live there long enough, you li- you're 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 rolling the dice, right? You're rolling the dice. You're taking a chance. Um, hopefully. It doesn't occur in your lifetime. I mean, just like all of us driving to work, uh, I don't want to jinx myself. I haven't been in an accident for a long <laughs> time, but we all, you know, it's just it, the timing of things. But if I live in a floodplain or an earthquake area or tornado alley, um, someplace that is prone to natural catastrophic events, um, I might not be setting myself up for success if I am a true survivalist and preparedness person. Yes, absolutely. or I do, or I got a water. I I do. I have a balloon in the backyard to get out of dodge, or something. You have a hot air balloon in the backyard. A hot air balloon. <laughs> but I said this too. I I I lived in a high rise building when I lived in Portland on the eleventh floor, and um, I have I have climbing gear. But if I lived in a thirty foot building in Manhattan or in San Fran, you know what I have? I, I I'm like okay. If if this thing is on fire. I would have rappel lines to hook to my damn balcony so I could I could rappel down and get out of there. That but that's just because I'm yeah. but I'm crazy like that. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a good idea. When, whenever I'm uh, doing any kind of work, uh, you know, my current job, and it puts me up somewhere high on the top of a building or what whatnot, I always make sure I've got a at least a seat, like a hasty seat I could put on a carabiner mm-hmm. and, and a bit of rope. Yep, last chance belt, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Apparently what the uh, chairman of the Oregon Seismic Safety Advisory Commission said, when the tsunami is coming, you run. 
you protect yourself. You don't turn around. You don't turn back for anything. You run for your life. Mm-hmm. No, not even, uh, you know, no time to find a flashlight, no time to hesitate amid the ruins of a home, no time to search for someone who's missing. That That is how fast he thinks you have to run. The numbers are, especially in the in the deeper ocean, that those those waves can can move about you know anywhere up to 500 miles per hour underneath the ocean surface, and you can't even see them uh, obviously until it gets in the shallower water and then comes ashore. That's incredibly incredibly fast. Let's just think about it. To run to run a 5k to get three miles away from the coast, you'd have to run. You know, a six-minute pace is going to get you 20 minutes away. And I used to be able to run a six-minute pace, but I'm not running a six-minute pace right now to get three miles. And who says three miles away is going to even be enough? You, you have to have you have to have some form of plan, like talking to your neighbors. Okay, if this happens, we're all gonna we're gonna pile in one vehicle instead of taking multiple vehicles to clog the road. I mean, there's contingencies that you can certainly think of that um, many of us, you know, we don't and. We're going, you know, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. So I don't need to practice this. I don't need to think about it. Or the, uh, they're just pessimists. And I'll just die in place or get swept away by the water. So let's talk about yeah, afterwards. Oh, Scott, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to throw in there the, uh, you know, having some type of off-road vehicle or one of those smaller mules or uh, kind of prowler, a little ATV type of deal. Um, mm-hmm. if the roads are down, that might get, that might, that might help out, uh, depending on, you know, you just never know how far off the coast the water surging from or how that, you know, is going to reverberate back and, and the speed it's going to get to you. But, um, those are other options. Yeah, it could definitely be good, another good option. So most of the preparing you should do is beforehand in a way before it ever happens. Right. And then, uh, if you're stuck in this type of a mega quake, you know, you're going to need a lot of luck to stay alive, but at least you guys have given us some hope of what you can do. But let's talk about afterwards. So if you are in this zone where millions of people live uh, and, you know, everything west of I-5 is toast, um, you know, it's estimated that it could take maybe three months, maybe six months to restore electricity, a year to restore drinking water and sewer service, a year to restore the major highways, and 18 months to restore healthcare facilities. Do you guys agree with those estimates? That sounds pretty reasonable. Sounds reasonable. And it also said, Matt, you know, uh, FEMA and nationally, uh, state could be ready to potentially bring food and water for two and a half million people. So not only with these time frames here, but think about getting food to two and a half million people and sustaining it, not just for a day or two, but for you know, three months before electricity comes back on or a year to get drinking water. That's going to, that's going to kill a lot of people. And like we always talk about that are all survivalists like to sugarcoat. Oh, well, you know, they'll be able to, to, to pee or poop anywhere. You know, what if you don't have a sewer, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go to the ba- bathroom? What are you going to do with that fecal matter and human waste? What's going to happen with dead bodies afterward? Where are they going? Where's the triage sites? Where's the burial sites? Yeah, you have in a lot addition, of disease. And- yep. Sorry, Scott. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no. Please continue your thought about you know rampant disease oh. and um, think about rabbit dogs you know, chewing on bodies. or I mean, there's a lot of it, – it's very grim what could happen. Yes. Yeah. yeah and it, it, even at, you know, on the coastal and bar- um, you know, bays and inlets and whatnot, and you've got the sewage treatment plants out there. Um, it, you know, it's not just the stuff coming from your house, but it's the stuff coming from everywhere, how it gets treated and then how it gets disseminated out. You know, typically that stuff gets pumped out, uh, to see, uh, quite a ways before it, it kind of gets dispersed and, and those lines break. Um, and you've just got a big, basically collection site, uh, for the stuff that's still making it somewhat down the pipes and no way to treat it. It's just going to, Yes, yeah, it's, it's going to turn into a biohazard zone uh, in mm-hmm. a short, uh, short time. I mean, it's going to severely tax the entire country, right? If something like this absolutely, happens. absolutely. So you know, if you're waiting That's... there for help, you know, help is probably not coming. So then you got to get into the things that we spoke about in other podcasts, which is water, food, place to put your waste, and and security, right? Weapons, yep. weapons, security, fire. 
the basic tenets of survival. How are you gonna How are you gonna sustain your life, your family? Uh, how are you gonna protect yourself? Where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna get out? How are you gonna get out of that biohazard area? Are you gonna move east of I five into the cities that now? Let's remember, you know, the Seattle's gonna get hit heavily. Portland's gonna get heavily hit heavily. All those those cities and towns in the Pacific Northwest, close to the I five corridor. What about we haven't even talked about them with have feeling the earthquake or feeling aftershocks from the earth, earthquake with emergency services? They're likely to go where first? They're going to go to the big cities where the most damage is done before they even reach rural areas. So if you're in the rural in between um, a small town and you know between Seattle and Portland, Oregon per se, there's there's a lot of little towns there that no one might get to them for days or weeks on end. So you have to be ready to to go it alone or go it with your neighbors or your your survival team or things we've discussed, like you said, Matt, in, in episodes and future episodes that we're going to continue to cover. And then I would imagine Absolutely true. if you live there, you're leaving, right? I mean, that, nobody can wait three years for clean water to come back, I would say. Yeah, that's that would that would be a pretty tough, uh, tough waiting period right there. It's safe to say, but think about the guys. Look at uh, look at the volcanoes in Hawaii. That people, you know, hey, it is recommended you evacuate your home. Well, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm staying. Katrina, it's recommended you evacuate. Well, I'm staying. I'm not leaving. That's what an exercise of futility, or they've, uh, you know, that God, for lack of another term, or you know, that it's in it's in someone else's hands, and they they could die in place and add once again add to the biohazard the thing that. I think always get sugar coated in a survival scenario where people who tout themselves as self as survivalist is one dude put your freaking bug out pack on and go hike that mountain and see how you do with it. See if you can jump over a wall. See if you can pull your wife out of a burning car. Then what are you going to do when you roll your ankle? You break your leg. Someone shoots you. You get freaking stabbed, scratched. You can't put you don't you run out of antibi- triple antibiotic treatment. Uh, oh, wait a minute. If you even have it in your first – if you even have a first aid kit on you, how are you going to take care of personal hygiene? Then how are you going to take care of the, the wounded, the dead? How are you going to self-treat yourself? How are you going to – where are you going to poop and pee? Are you going to dig a cat hole? Are you going to dig a slit trench for your your neighbors? What are you going to do and how are you going to manage that? How are you going to manage diabetics, the, the old elderly, the people with disease? What happens when people can't get insulin? What happens when people can't get cardiac medication? What's going to happen to all of them in this – the coastal areas, first of all, because the coast is still uh, – depending on the town, it's still 90 miles plus away from like say Portland. It's even longer than that. I mean it's it's a distance and we didn't talk about Seattle getting hit too on the Puget Sound. How much water is going to come in and hit them? So like, it's going to be nasty. Yeah. Really bad. Yep, yep. And you know, again, you you know, uh, look at the death tolls historically from earthquakes, and they're just massive. You know, there was the uh, the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami that we all remember, and and mm-hmm. that was a horrific event with 280 thousand people dead. If there's that many people that are dead. You know, like you said, it's it's a it's a it's a biological hazard everywhere you turn. Yeah, very bad. So for the survivals. Survivors, food, water, shelter, uh, fire, security, uh, like we've seen and we've discussed in flooding, in snowstorms, in ice storms, in hurricanes, people, they've, they've come together for the most part. I mean, we can cite examples of, I mean, look at Katrina. There was, there was rioting, there was looting, there was a lot of, there wasn't too much coming together, um, but there was when help finally got there. Uh, yeah. Hey, Mark, real quick too. You hit on a. You actually hit on a, a lot of really good points. Two of them that I just want to highlight. Um, you know, is the uh, you know, testing out your gear, testing out your routes, making sure you can you can actually do what in theory you're planning to do. You know, in case if something happens. And uh, the other thing is, you know, your neighbors and, and the folks around you. The people in the community, um, just the rest of the population there. Typically, what what happens um, after a disaster is the first 24 to 72 hours, 
uh, people are, for the most part, um, you know, there's, there's folks who have bad intentions all the time, uh, with what they do. And so that, you know, there'll be some looting and, and some crime and stuff too. But the majority of the population is typically very helpful to each other during that period. Um, but then after people start running into issues with food, shelter and, uh, and water and whatnot, uh, that's when things start to, to get a little, a little bit more ugly for everyone. And you see a lot more, uh, rampant, uh, people hurting each other and, and, you know, taking advantage of each other and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's sort of like what, how far would you go for your kids if they don't have anything to eat or drink? You'd go pretty far, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like how long, how long are you going to, well, help will be on the way. Help will be on the way. Help will be on the way. And then it's like, well, it's time to help. It's time to help myself. All right, so that was a very uh, cheery edition of the Survivalist (laughs) podcast. Thank you so much, Scott, for your expertise. And Mark, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Scott, very much. And uh, like, we hope to get you on in future episodes. And like we say, you know, hopefully this isn't going to occur, but we want to we want to get you thinking, and we want you. I mean, people ask me all the time, "Oh, you're a survivalist, or you're a prepper," and I'm like, I believe. All of us should be prepared. When you send your Absolutely. three girl, when you send your three girls to school, like I was talking to someone the other day, have a plan. When you take that vacation, have a plan. When when you go to the movies, have a plan. When you go to the rest when you go to a restaurant, have a plan. If some crazy fucker walks in with a gun, have a plan. Think about it. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it's not too hard. You know, it doesn't have to you know, you can take this to extremes or you can, you know, just think about it logically. If you, if you're going in a theater with your family, if you're going into, uh, uh, you know, some type of building where there's not inside out, outside light coming in, just throw a flashlight in your, in your pocket, throw a flashlight in your purse or, you mm-hmm. know, whatever, and, and be able to get out, you know, just make sure you can get out of the building, just little stuff here and there. And, you know, your average everyday person, um, who's super busy with whatever they're, they're doing, they can, you know, just taking five minutes to think about possible scenarios before they get into them can uh, can mitigate a lot of headaches and, and pain and suffering. Yeah, potentially save their lives. You've been listening to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhale and Matt Gould. Brought to you by Survival Cash, Ford Survival Supply, and TheBugOutRace.com. Please visit our website, the survivalist podcast.com this show is produced by chad dugats at the hangar studios in new york city 